Okay, so our goal now is uh, to solve this constrained optimization problem to find the optimal parameters W star and B star for our hyperplane to correctly classify our points and maximize the margin between both classes. And this is the problem. Uh, this is the um, SVM constrained optimization problem. So if you guys can know this, what, what do we have here? So we have a first term that we want to minimize. This is our loss function. L of W, such that we have another function here that we can define. So this function depends on what? On these two variables that we want, or parameters, vectors, we want to um, estimate. So W is a vector, B is a scalar. So we want Fi, the, the function Fi, to be um, greater or equal than zero. So this is our constraint, okay? so. Uh, this is our condition. We want to correctly classify each point i, put it on the right side of the uh, hyperplane. So here I just removed the b, but it actually has the b, so it's just a parameter. We can combine them both, like uh, combine the w vector and the scalar b using the compact form, uh, the w tilde, right? So we have b and w. So in this case, you know, it will, we will it will tag along, but uh, we can also completely remove it and it will still uh, be valid, okay? So what we want to solve, we have, we have many constraints. So we have a constraint for each data point i, okay? So the problem can be formalized in this way. So we want to minimize over the space of parameters w, l of w, our loss function, such that, okay, as such, so such that, this condition is fulfilled. Okay, so we want our um, we want f of w to be greater or equal to a constancy, and if we this is the general uh, formalization of a constraint optimization problem that's similar to the one we want to solve, right? And in our case, we have c equal to what zero. Okay, right. So let's look at this more closely. So here we have, uh, if you guys remember, so this is, you know, like just like before you guys remember, uh, what we want to solve here is this problem, right? So this is, <clears throat> this is a very uh, challenging problem to solve mathematically. And uh, looking at this geometrically, like looking at how can we intuitively uh, formalize it will, will, uh, will be helpful if we use basically, if we look at um, this uh, from a geometric perspective, okay? So figures and drawings always help to uh, give us an intuition of what exactly we are looking for, okay? So it's very interesting. Uh, let's look at this. So if you guys remember when we uh, learned about gradient descent, if we have, uh, we learned a few properties about uh, the negative of the gradient direction when we plot the contours of a function of a loss function L of W. So this is our loss function. So, and the W, okay? So we define what we call the contour or the level, uh, the level contour of the loss function where the loss function at each contour. So when we vary the W, we know that all those points, the loss function is equal to a constant, for example, two here, right? And then we projected it. So we project this, uh, imagine this is in a three dimensional space. So we project the whole function. Um, and this is the first contour. And then we define the second contour. And this is well, LW takes a larger value, right? So it's like uh, here, uh, right? So sorry. Here it's L of W, right? And this is the W. So it takes a larger value, for example, let's say uh, five. So this is the second contour. And the L is actually constant along this contour. So, um, and then we have another one. So this is uh, L of W equals to 10. So all values here of W are equal to L of W of is equal to 10. So here, let's say, for example, if we select a point, for example, this point, right? So uh, W1, W2, 
we know that all points here that satisfy this, okay, so for example, another point, W1 uh, prime, W2 prime, so we know these two points, right, we know that L of W is equal to L of W prime is equal to to what? To, in this case, we select it. it's equal to 5, okay? Because they all lie on the orange contour, okay? So this is just a brief reminder. Now let's look at this. Well, what did we see before? We saw that, so in gradient descent, the gradient at each point that lies on the contour, it's, it's the negative of the gradient, uh, the gradient is perpendicular to the to um, the contours. This is number one. And the second thing is like we want to move along the negative, basically, uh, direction of the gradient towards what? Towards our optimum because our minimum. Because we know here that this is, you know, uh, a loss function. So the values in the, um, uh, the let's call them the, uh, uh, far away contours, so here for example we have L of W equals to 10, this one L of W equals to um, uh, 8, okay, then for this one, for the green one, we have L of W, so it's decreasing, right, we know that it's it should be decreasing, right, and we're, we're following this, we want to minimize our loss and we're slowly moving, jumping for one from one contour to the, the other one using the um, by using gradient descent, and we saw that this might generate some zigzagging behavior, etc. But for now, what we want to know, what we want to do, is basically minimize this. So if we remove the constraint and we have a general loss function that we want to minimize, we will just keep moving along these contours, okay, until we find our optimal our optimum. Okay, so W star, right? So this is our optimum. Here it locates at 0, 0, right? So W1 is equal to 0, and W2, the second component of our parameter, is equal to 0. And in this case, W is a two-dimensional vector, right? So, however, what do we have? We have something else. We have a an, a, an additional condition. So let's say, so just for the sake of simplicity, we know that, um, let's take it just for granted, uh, that if we solve this optimization problem, it also boils down to solving uh, this condition such that f of w is equal to uh, a constant c, okay? So this is, you know, like kind of um, the same thing, so we will not uh, prove this, but I would like you guys to keep in mind that solving this, this inequality, um, boils down as if you know it, it can be solved also by setting the condition to uh, the constant value c okay great so here let's move let's look at what is this exactly so f of w equals to c this is exactly um a contour line of the function it means the function is constant we, we're looking for all w's right we're trying to find all w's such that f of w is equal to c, so it's constant, right? So let's say this is the contour where f of w is equal to c, and in this space, it lies exactly here, okay? So in this, on this contour, what do we have? We have, uh, let's choose another curl, so color, so here, we have f of w is equal to our constant c. Okay, great. So now we want to satisfy these two conditions. So we want, we are looking for what? We're looking for the w, the vector w, the set of parameters, okay? Such that we are minimizing L and also we are, uh, our points should lie on this contour, okay? So we know that we want to find all points or or possible solutions to this constraint optimization problem such that our uh, loss, you know, the contours of the loss function L, they are uh, in line or tangent to the uh, contours of the contour of F, right? So before we go into this, I would like you to imagine the F functions also it has so many rings, right? 
but uh, it takes different values. But we are interested particularly in the value C because this is our condition. So we know that we, were, we need to find our optimum W on this contour specifically, okay? And the second thing, we know that we want to lie on a minimal contour of L because we don't want to, you know, take higher values of L. We want to minimize L of W. So we know our W should uh, minimize the value of the loss function, okay? So it should lie on a lower contour of L where L of W takes a minimum value. Okay, so these are the two conditions to satisfy. Now, we look at this, we know that we also we want to minimize the uh, L. So here, these are the intersections. So we need to look at where this contour, F of W, intersects our the contours of L. So we have uh, these points, these key points. And here, basically, uh, there is, we want, what we want, we want both curves or contours to be tangent, okay? So they, they are very close. So we want the Ws to lie on this contour, but also on the other one. So there are other points where these um, the contours just intersect. We were we are not interested in those points uh, because these points will not will have like um, completely different directions of the gradient because the gradient here it will you know like move towards this direction and the other ones the other direction but we it's a minimization optimization problem so basically our we want these two curves to be tangent right the two contours so here we have different we have four candidate points Ws okay. So these are the candidate points. If we project them, we know their coordinates exactly. But let's look, which ones are the best? So here, let's say for this contour, for this, sorry, for this point, we know that f of w is equal to c, okay? Because all of those points, they, they lie on this uh, contour, so they satisfy the constraint. However, um, for l, we know that this point lies on the pink one, so the l is equal to eight. Uh, for this one, it's also, it also lies on the pink one, on the pink contour, so L of W is equal to 8. But for this one, right, so let's say this contour is, um, right, the purple contour right there. And uh, L should be lower than um, 5 because it's just like this contour is like, um, it's basically uh, lies inside the green one, so... L of W is equal to 2, for example. So we know right here, we know that for this point, these two points, because uh, we know that L of W is equal to 2. So when we compare those, when we compare like the, all these four points, okay, we know that the best ones are, are the ones that satisfy L of W is equal to 2. Okay, so basically these are our best candidates. Now, what is particular to these points? So we know that these are our um, these are good optimal points, solutions to this problem. What do we guys know this? So we know this that the negative of the gradient, so so uh, of the loss function, so this is minus L of W. And if we also compute the uh, negative of the gradient of the F function, so F of W. We notice that they are these two vectors are collinear and they point towards the same direction, okay? Because they're the curves are tangents right there. So both of these vectors, these gradients, are should be perpendicular to the contours of the loss function and the constraint. So this is exactly the condition that we're deriving from this case. So here, what do we have? We know at optimal points. Okay, so we know at optimal points, W star, we should have we should have the negative of the gradient of the loss function is uh, basically collinear, have the same direction as the negative of the gradient of the uh, F function, the constraint itself, right? So here, something else, actually we need to take f of w, right, so let's put it this way, so we need to, this is a negative, f of w minus c, generally, so here we, we, we know that um, the c doesn't matter because it's a constant, so we're, we're, we're just, you know, we, we want 
basically the two gradients to be perpend uh, to be collinear, like they point towards the same direction, and we can remove the negative, right? So this is the condition that the optimal points should satisfy. Okay, so this is the the most important thing that you guys need to remember from this video is that the gradients should be um, collinear, and we know that alpha should be greater or equal to zero because the two vectors should point to the same direction. So, you know, if this is vector v, vector u, we know that v is equal to alpha u with alpha positive. Okay, great. Now, let's define what we call now the Lagrangian function, L of w, as L minus alpha times the um, condition. So here we want alpha f of w uh, minus c equals to, to be equal to zero. So f of w minus c to be equal to zero. And since basically our c is equal to zero, as we know this before in this case, okay? So let's write it this way, okay? In our case in particular, we'll get rid of the c because it's equal to zero. So basically, let's keep it like that. So let's now keep the c, right? So what do you guys know this for this newly defined function? So let's write it properly. So we have L of w equals the Lagrangian of w is equal to the loss minus alpha f of w minus c. Okay, so here this is this is the um, Lagrangian function, and if we if we derive it, so with respect to w, what do we if we compute the gradient of Lagrangian? Okay, with respect to w, what do we find? So we compute the gradient of l with respect to w minus alpha, the gradient of f. Okay, and this is a constant, so it's zero. So this is what we exactly get, right? And remember guys, the gradient of L of W is equal to the partial derivative of W of L with respect to the first component, all, you know, the components of W, but here we have only two. So it's this vector, right? So you guys need to remember the dimensionalities of your variables. So this belongs to RD because our vector W belongs to RD and also our samples belongs to RD, okay? If we have D features. Great, so what do you guys know this here? So from this condition, we know that these two, like if we compare these two, what is the value what is the uh, gradient of L if we compute it? So we know that this is actually it should be equal to this term. So the gradient of the Lagrangian is equal to what? To zero. So now we know that this is an important condition that uh, will help us solve this optimization problem. Okay? Great. So just you know to sum it up. So what are the steps? So the first one, so we need to define the original, this is the original what we call the primal optimization problem that we want to solve. Then the next step would be to define the Lagrangian. So this is the Lagrangian, it's equal to the cost function to optimize minus alpha, the, and this is what we call the Lagrangian multiplier. We define it for each constraint, so it's defined per constraint, and we know that the alpha should be positive. Uh, it's a positive number or scalar and we multiply by our constraint, okay? So uh, this is, you know, the Lagrangian. Then what we need to do, the last step, would be to solve for the W, the B, and also uh, the alpha because it's a parameter now. So, but for now, we're just focused on these two, right? So we want to find all those parameters. And to do that, we simply need to solve this set of linear equations. Like, it's just, you know, now uh, using um, linear algebra tools to solve these set of equations where we set the gradient to zero so we compute the gradient of the Lagrangian, right? So this is the gradient of the Lagrangian and we set it to zero and we solve for this one, okay? And also we need to use all the constraints so we know that our uh, parameters w and b they satisfy particular constraint like this one 
Okay, so uh, and we set the constraint to zero in this case. So we know that we should all we should add our constraint. And by adding our constraints, we can we can find our optimal W star and B star. And yes, so this is what we're going to do now to our problem. So for our to, to solve our problem. So here, this is exactly the Lagrangian. So we define it in this way. So we have our loss function uh, L of W minus alpha I. So uh, we're summing over all our constraint and this is uh, the constraint that we have. So we have, if you guys go back, so we want this to be equal to zero. So we can just, you know, multiply by, um, so we don't need to multiply here. So basically this is our condition, our constraint. And now what we need to do is to compute the uh, gradient, the de partial derivative basically of the uh, Lagrangian with respect to um, the W. Okay, so um, we need to compute the gradient of L with res or the partial derivative with respect to W, set the gradient to zero or the partial derivative to zero, right? And then uh, solve and find the W. So this should be quite straightforward. I would suggest that you guys pause the video, look at those hints, okay? And compute this, compute the partial derivative of L with respect to the vector W, set it to zero and find the optimal parameter W star, okay? Great, so we can also do this together. So here, let's look at this. So what do we have? We have first, this is a dot product, right? So um, the norm, uh, so this squared norm of W is the, you know, W dotted with itself. So the derivative of a dot product is 2w. So let's write it down. So we have 1 half times 2w minus uh, the sum over we have. So we need to expand this, right? So alpha i, yi. And then we know that the partial derivative of xi transpose w uh, with respect to w is equal to xi. So xi, right? And then uh, we have the other terms actually do not depend on w because you know the second term and the last one do not depend on w. So that's it. So this is basically our um, uh, partial derivative of the La Lagrangian. And here we know that this belongs to what? So uh, we know that should belong to rd because w belongs to rd, okay? And also each sample xi. So this is, you know, sample xi, our data point, it belongs to rd. Great, now if we set it to zero, what do we have? So we need to set this is this to zero, so we know the two will disappear. So this means our w star is equal to what? It's equal to the sum over all, all training points of alpha i, y i is the label, and our training sample xi. Okay, so now we found our optimal w, right? So this is very important because the w defines the margin. Remember, it locates the hyperplane. So it carries all the information we need to perform our linear classification. Now, what do you guys notice? So w depends on what? It depends on our training samples xi and their labels, right? And also the alpha, but mainly the training samples. This is why it is. This is why when we use, for example, cross validation, when we perturb our training set, we will get different Ws. So, for example, just as a brief reminder, so if we have these are our points, right? And let's say uh, that these are our training samples. We um, estimate we the optimal hyper plane that separates them. So this is W star one for our data set. Uh, right. And then if we move, if we remove some points, right, if we remove some points, you can see that the optimal W will be completely different. It, can, it will completely change, right? 
So this is very important because you know we know that this W depends on those on the on the training on the training samples, and this is visible here through this equation, right? So that's one uh, one uh, one thing to uh, keep in mind. And then now let's look for let's try to compute the um, the B. So to do that, we also derive, we compute the partial derivative of L with respect to B, set it to zero and see what we get. So let's do that. So here we know that this first term, it does not depend on B, so it's zero minus sum, the sum over all our training points of, right, so we have the first term. This first term does not depend on B, so that's a zero. So then what do we have? We have alpha i y i times b. And if we derive this with respect to b, so uh, b uh, will, uh, it's like deriving, you know, alpha x dx. So this is exactly alpha, okay? So here we'll have alpha i y i. So this should be sub i, right? And uh, then that's all we have. And the last part is just a constant, so its derivation uh, is equal to zero. So setting this, the Lagrangian, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to b, it will give us this condition, that the sum basically over all, all training points, alpha i times their labels, should be equal to zero. So this is basically a new constraint that we found and that we can use to uh, find the optimal W and, um, and B. So remember, we need to add all the constraints that pop up, the original ones and those that pop up along the way to solve this, to find the optimal W star and B star. Okay, so, uh, right, so what do you guys know this? So as I mentioned before, the B, uh, we noticed that basically once we found this, the margin, the margin and also uh, the position of the hyperplane, they depend on what? On the training points and also on what? On the alpha. Now we will look at the alpha because alpha, this Lagrangian multiplier is very important because here we can see that this is actually uh, it can it weighs it weighs all these uh, training uh, samples. So not all training samples are important for our classification ta ta task. You can look. So this is basically what it's just a linear combination of all training samples. So the W can be seen viewed as a linear combination of all our training samples, uh, taking into account their labels, but also the alpha. Right. So this is a a weighted sum of all the training samples. Giving weights to training samples, it means not all of them might have the same alpha. So this is, for example, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. We know that all those alpha 4, etc., alpha 5, we know that all those alphas are, are positive, but we know that they also might take different values. So this W depends on these samples, but these samples do not have the same weight, so they contribute differently. So samples might contribute differently to uh, finding W star. Okay, great. So now after finding, let's say, our W star, our optimal W and BW, let's look at this. What we need to do is plug in the W uh, star. So we have it, we have the explicit uh, form of the W. And now what we need to do is like we need to compute the Lagrangian, right? So why it's important to compute the Lagrangian? So without any like deep mathematical details, I would like you guys to keep in mind that basically, if we're, we're able to solve this problem, this is what we call the primal problem. So let me write it down here. So, right. So the primal problem, this is our original problem, is minimize 
So we want to minimize over uh, w, l of w, such that f of w is greater or equal to a constant c. Okay, so this minimizing this problem, if we do it, then it means that we are also, we need to um, maximize what we call the dual, the dual problem, which means that we maximize the Lagrangian at our optimal parameters w, and we maximize this. Okay, so we plug the w star over alpha. So we now need to find the alphas, right? Because we know the alphas, they, they contribute to this margin, right? They contribute to finding the optimal w. So these alphas are very important. Now, without any um, like um, mathematical details, we know that these problems, solving this one, you know, uh, implicates that we can also, we need to solve, we, we need to maximize the Lagrangian, okay? So we want the value that the Lagrangian takes uh, at the optimum w, right, to be maximum. And to maximize this, we need to find the best set of alphas, okay, the best uh, set or the best values um, set of um, Lagrangian multipliers, Lagrangian multipliers, okay? So, right, so to do that, the next, the first step would be to compute the Lagrangian at the optimum, right? So this is the first step. And then we look, we look, we try to find the maximum of the Lagrangian with respect to the alpha. Great. So here in this step, what we were doing, we're just computing the Lagrangian and at the optimum. So we're, we're looking at its values, like what it's, like uh, we're trying to find its explicit form. So here, let's do this together. So the first one we need to plug, you know, this formula. So this is a dot product and the definition of a dot product is, so we have W equals the sum over I of alpha I, Y I samples X I, and it's the squared norm, so here, we need to change the index, so j i1 and alpha j, so this is by definition, okay, so x j. And then we have the first term, which is alpha i y i x i transpose w, so here minus sum of alpha i y i, X I transpose, right? And then we need to multiply by the W vector. So here we will change the indices. So alpha J, Y J, X J. And we have another term, which is like um, this term, alpha I, Y I, B. So it's minus sum over i to n alpha i y i b then the last term is alpha i okay so minus minus so that's a plus on to n alpha i and that's it okay so what do you guys know this so remember that we know that this this sum is equal to zero, and this is a constant, so we can put it outside, okay? So it does not depend on the index. So this is equal to zero, so this term will disappear. And also we notice that these terms, okay? So here I forgot it transpose because basically this is a, a dot product, right? So there's a transpose there. So these terms are equal, okay? So we have these, uh, well, actually, what we're trying to do, so we can just completely, so if we're going to transpose this, right, so it's a dot product, so that's right, that's correct, so this is a dot product between these two points, so that's right. Now, yeah, so what we have, we have these terms are equal, right? So uh, here, since our, 
we have two equal terms, so we can simplify things. And to simplify, look at what we have. So basically, this is half minus this term, so it's minus half. Okay, this is the first term. And this term is equal to zero, and then we have the second term. So now we have computed the Lagrangian, and this is exactly the, um, the value or the explicit uh, formula for the Lagrangian evaluated at the optimal points. And it's important to keep in mind that this is our optimal point. Now, what do you guys notice? So something very interesting. So this Lagrangian that now we want to maximize. So we want to maximize. We've, we want to find the alpha, the set of alpha i for the Lagrangian computed at the optimum, right? So uh, B star, we still, we haven't explicitly computed it, but uh, here, let's just write it down. So here, and it also the Lagrangian depends on what? It depends on the alpha i. So we want to maximize the Lagrangian. So to maximize it and find the best set of parameters alpha i that will enable us to compute the w because it depends on those alpha i's if you guys remember. So alpha i, y i, and x i. So this is the sample. So we need to find those guys, right? And to find those guys, we need to maximize the Lagrangian. It will enable us to find the alpha i. Now, Let's look at this uh, Lagrangian, right, at the optimum point. So what does it depend on? It depends on the labels of the training points and dot product between two training samples. So this is very important, right? So you can see that the dot product or projecting one sample onto another sample enables us to uh, define, find the optimal parameters. So modeling this pairwise re relationship between two samples is very important. So let's say, for example, this is our sample, a sample xi, and we have other samples, right? We have, for example, on the plane, we have different samples, x1, x2, right, x3, so, and then we have the samples belonging to the other class, x4, x5. So what does this mean? It's very interesting. It means that for each point, so this is a double summation, right, because what we had here, we have the sum over i, sum over j. So we merge them together, right? Alpha i, these are scalars, so we can put them together. Okay, alpha i, alpha j, y i, y j. And then we have the sample x i transpose times the another sample x j. But we're summing over all of them. So we're considering the pairwise um, relationship or the projection, the pairwise projection between all possible uh, pairs of training samples, okay? So let's look at, uh, for example, sample xi. So we're, we're computing, we're projecting all other samples onto this one. So let's say we, these are all our samples. So we're just projecting them, okay? And this, and summing all those projections uh, by this weighted sum. So, so this can be regarded as a weight. So it's a weighted sum, okay? This is a sum a weighted sum of all those projections for each point. So this is just for one point x i. And interestingly, what does a dot product tell us? It tells us, you know, how two vectors are related. If they're like um, close, if they're far away, if they have similar magnitude, right? If they uh, point in the opposite direction. So this dot product between two vectors, x i and x j, it it is actually, it models the relationship, okay? It captures the relationship between what? Between the features, okay? Of two training points. And this is exactly what the definition of a dot product, so xi transpose xj, is equal to, if we have, you know, xi belonging to R2, so just two components or two features, then it models the relationship between those features by this projection process or dot product process. So we have xi preacher 1, xj 
feature 1 plus xi feature 2, xj feature 2. Right. So this is, this is very uh, important. And you can see that projections, they drive um, like the field of machine learning and, and many, many problems and uh, enabling, you know, uh, basically modeling or capturing this relationship, comparing pairs of samples, you know, like two uh, samples, uh, one pair by one pair and exploring this, the relationship, the pairwise relationship between uh, all those samples, right? So we take the pairwise relationship between this guy and all of those, and also this guy and all of those, right? And then the other one, right? So here you can see that I'm kind of building a graph, but um, yeah, so this is, this is it. We want to model the pairwise relationship between all of those because, you know, if they're too close, their dot product will tell us, you know, how close they are. So we, we, hypo we think that, so if we want to think more about this, two points that, you know, might be very similar, okay? So if they're too similar, like if you want to classify, for example, uh, images of trees and faces, right? So you know that two faces will be similar, right? So I would expect the dot product between these two points, these two vectors, if I dot them, like I move this, I would expect it to be, uh, I would expect it to be quite large. It means like they're, they're similar, right? So, uh, and also for the other guys, so for the other class. So these two, like two points here, should also be similar. But if I take, you know, um, if I dot, if I dot, you know, a, a vector of sample from the face class class with a sample from the other class, they should be different. So the dot product tells us a lot about two samples. It's uh, and about the relationships between uh, between them. Okay, great. So here, now that we uh, computed the Lagrangian, uh, we know what it looks like. We know that it's just it just depends on dot products between pairs of training samples. Our goal is to find the alpha, right? So, guys, let's la write this down. So, if you remember, this is our loss function. And let's say our constraint, this is um, the contour of our constraint. And we want to find, basically, uh, the right solution. So, we have different solutions. We have four. But not all of them are right. So, we want to find the optimal one. And to find the optimal one, we need to also get the alphas, right? So that will help us to find the optimal one because the primal problem has different solutions. So we need to not solve the first constraint problem, but we by optimizing over the alpha, right? We will we will find basically we will refine this first solution. Okay, we will uh, find the right conditions uh, to further refine these um uh these solutions. Okay, great. Uh, so here, if we write this down. What do we have? We have L of W star, B star, which this solves the primal problem. So we know that W star, B star here is, you know, uh, it minimizes L. So L has a minimum value here, minus the sum of over alpha I, F I, W star, B star, so what do you guys notice here? So here we have, we know that this condition is like strictly positive, as you remember from the beginning. And we know also that the alpha i is positive. But what we want to do, we want to maximize this. So we want, I move this a bit to the right, okay. So we want to maximize over all alpha i. Okay, knowing that alpha i is positive. So what is the maximum value that, knowing that this is all positive, right? Okay, what is the maximum value that the Lagrangian at the optimum that we computed earlier uh, can take? What is the maximum value? So let's look at this. So we remember that 
basically this is this condition so the fi is positive this is positive which means that this term the a term is positive right and subtracting subtracting something positive from from the l from a quantity it will it will it will always decrease it it will even if it's you know if this loss is still like right so and we know that the loss also should be positive because l it's just the norm it's half of the squared norm of w so it's positive so to maximize the Lagrangian over the alpha, what we need to do, right? We ideally, we want to set this term to zero. So we want this term to be equal to zero. So then the maximum value that it will take is this value, okay? At W star. So by setting this to zero, what do we know this? So since these are two positive, so we're, we're, we have a sum over alpha i, f i, we're multiplying two positive quantities. If we set them to zero, one of them should be equal to zero or both equal to zero. So in this case, we cannot have them both equal to zero because this will, uh, will not be feasible in our, like it's, it's, it's not possible in our case. So um, what we were gonna look at is the other cases. So we have basically uh, to set the term a to zero, we can have either alpha i equals to uh, zero or the other term, okay, f i, the constraint is equal to zero. And actually we know that, uh, you know, this is our constraint at our optimal points. So at the optimal points, um, we know that this condition should always be satisfied. So always, always positive, right? Um, it doesn't matter here because that's our constraint. Now, what does this mean? Let's look at this. So we either have alpha i equals to zero or f i equals to zero. So for alpha i strictly positive, okay, what do we have? We have f i should be equal to zero. So alpha i is when alpha i is not equal to zero and it's positive, okay, so we know that at least it should be strictly greater than zero, so but not equal to zero, right? So, uh, so if, sorry, so and this is in the other case. So we need if fi is equal to zero. So here we know that this should be greater than zero. And if alpha i is equal to zero, so this is another case. So here, what do we have? We have the rest of the points, which means we have fi strictly greater than zero. So it's the other way around, okay? So these are two important conditions that would tell us a lot about the alpha i, okay? So here, in this condition, so if you guys remember, when do we have this, when, which point satisfy this is equal to zero? We know that these points should lie on the hyperplane. So we know that if we're basically classifying these points, we know that points on the marginal hyperplane, one of them, okay? They satisfy this equality. This is by definition, okay? We know that um, when it's equal to zero, these points would lie on the marginal planes. And for uh, if they are greater than zero, then they are correctly classified, okay? Strictly greater than zero. So this condition, say, basically implicates that those points, okay, those points x, i, all those training samples, they should lie on the marginal plane, okay, either of them. So here, just to sum up, what do we have? We have a very important condition. So we have, we know that for points that lie on the marginal hyperplanes, the alpha i should be strictly positive. And for the others, okay, so this is, you know, condition one, otherwise, so which is the second case, otherwise, when they are just correctly classified, we know that the alpha i should be equal to what? It should be equal to zero. So all other points uh, that do not lie on the marginal plane, they have an alpha i equals to zero. And this is a very powerful concept. So here, if we uh, just, you know, um, look at the, our optimal 
W star, which depends on the alpha. We know that now, okay, based on this, we know that if alpha i is strictly positive, then point x i lies on uh, the, a hyperplane, a marginal hyperplane, okay, marginal, marginal hyperplane. And we know that if alpha i is equal to zero, then x i uh, does not lie, basically. It's just correctly classified, okay? So it does not lie. Or let's say it is not marginal, okay? Is not marginal. Great. Okay, so let's look at this now. So what do we have here? So here we know that based on this definition, marginal points have strictly positive alpha, like this point and also the other point. And the W actually uh, and, uh, only depends on those strictly positive points because um, W star is equal to uh, then N alpha I, Y, I, X, I. So all other points, we know that alpha i for this one is equal to zero because it's not it doesn't lie on the you know marginal hyperplanes, right? I know that the alpha i for this one is equal to zero. What does that tell us about w? This is very important, right? Think about it for a minute. So the w basically star only depends on those points that lie on the margin. And this, these points, we call, call them support vectors. Why, you remember guys, like each point is a vector, right? So this is what we call them support vectors. And this is uh, the uh, definition, this is the name of like basically of SVM. It's a support vector machines. It's a linear classifier in this case. Okay, it's a classifier. Uh, so support vectors because it's optimal parameters. It's the whole solution that we're looking for is parameterized, is defined by these support vectors, these marginal points that lie on the margin. So here if we call, call this a support point. So then all we're looking for is these xs, okay? S1, another xs2, okay? So we are summing about uh, over all the s's, right? And these are the, what we call them the marginal points. Okay, great. So uh, this is, you know, something uh, important to remember about support vector machines. Now, if we want to find the B star, how do we find it? So we can just, you know, uh, look at the uh, those the equality that this point satisfies, a support point satisfies. So we have a support point S, right? And we know that this support point xs, it should satisfy this equality. So it's equal because it lies on the hyperplane. So we have xs transpose w star plus the b star, right? So which we are looking for now to compute is equal to y and y is its label. So in this case, if this is, you know, minus one and this is, you know, plus one, so it's equal to minus one. But now let's keep it like that. So to, to derive the b, we just, you know, do, uh, simple math, so it's equal to y minus x as transpose. Uh, it's a dot product between a support vector or sample and the optimal w, okay? So you can see now that, you know, the b, the w depend on, uh, both of them depend on these marginal points. And this is actually kind of intuitive because if you look Guys, if you look at this one, right, let's look at this figure. So what do we have here? If you want to classify those points, what are the hardest points to classify? So let's say these guys lie far away, right? So these are easy to classify, but the most difficult ones are the ones that are close to the boundary. So the idea is the intuition. Even if, uh, if I ask you to draw a line, so the first thing that like that maximizes the space between these two classes, like the first thing that uh, you uh, unconsciously do is like you know just compare the distance between the extreme points or the uh, marginal points. So you want to maximize this space. 
So you don't draw the line somewhere around here or around there, right? You don't do that, but you're, you're, you're looking, you're, you're just searching for those points. If you identify those marginal points, okay? If you identify the points on the margin, then you have solved this problem because then you know that these vectors, these points, they define the margin, right? And then your hyperplane will be in the middle of that, right? So this is, you know, intuitive. Now you can see that how magical and how awesome it is to go from intuition, from what you, like, just, you know, um, when you look at the problem and think about it and do it automatically without, you know, necessarily knowing that, oh, I'm looking for this, this is how I'm drawing the line, but actually what you're looking for is these extreme points, these marginal points that lie on the hyperplane, right? And then we're, we went from the intuition from, uh, you know, what our imagination, and we translated that into maths. And then somehow going from maths, we converge back to our intuition. And this is, you know, intuition versus mathematics alignment. It's, it's very powerful and very beautiful because we simply, you know, approved by mathematics that this is actually what we're looking for. This is what what defines the this is how we define the decision boundary between these two classes. Okay, so what are the samples? Let's look at these questions so that I answered partly. What are the samples that are most difficult to classify? It's the support samples. Okay, that lie on the marginal hyperplanes. So what directly affects the process of finding the optimum location of the decision boundary? Okay, so W star depends on what? Now we know that our W star only depends on these basically support vectors. If we can find them, then the problem is solved. Okay, but I would like you guys to keep in mind that to remember that this is not always the case, but because if we have, for example, let's say, this is our training matrix XTR, and here we have our set of training samples. So uh, let me just choose another color. So let's say these are our training samples, right? Belonging to class one, and then maybe uh, we have other samples belonging to class two. And what we want to estimate, we want to map them, learn, you know, the parameters W star, B star, which maps them into the label space. Okay, so we want to find that this is plus one and the rest is like minus one, okay? But it's not obvious, right? You might say, oh, I can easily find the support points. You cannot easily find them because when you look at those features, remember, there are many things we need to keep in mind. We want to explore the relationship between each feature vector, each sample and other feature vectors, right? The pairwise relationship, this is number one. So this is something to uh, like, um, <laughs> that we are using to find the optimal parameters. And the second one is, I don't know which ones, like which, we don't know which vectors lie on the margin. Might be like a vector right there. We don't know. So we're looking for those support vectors, those difficult samples to classify, the hardest ones. And once we find them, then our problem is solved. Okay, so this is exactly what we have here. So we know that uh, for uh, we know that it's only a very small subset of training samples called the support vectors that can fully specify the decision function and that's why our W depends on those support vectors okay great now in the testing stage it's very similar to the perceptron very straightforward so if we have a testing point uh, X test right so this is our testing sample that we want to classify, what we need to do is uh, basically plug everything in. So we know that this depends on the support vectors now. So alpha, uh, S, Y, S, X, S, right? So that's the optimal W star. And here we just compute the sign of this, which tells us if the, the point lies on the, you know, uh, on top of the hyperplane or below the hyperplane. Okay, within a margin uh, two, so like this is, you know, half of the margin. So the margin is 
2 divided by w and we're using l2 norm okay so that's very simple and you can see also in the testing stage that our classifier depends on those marginal points Great, so that's that's it. So that's support vector machines and how it works. And this is actually, uh, 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 this is, you know, an active area of research. So there are books uh, in machine learning fully and solely dedicated to studying and examining support vector machines. And there are many other problems that we need to think about, like, for example, how it can handle, uh, can it handle nonlinear data? Outliers, what happens if we have outliers? So outliers means points that lie far away from the distribution of this. So the point might be somewhere right here because these are outliers. How can it handle outliers? How does it, um, uh, how does it handle outliers if uh, it does, right? So, so these are questions that you guys can think about. You can just make a drawing, look at those equations, you know, uh, look at the dot products and imagine what's going to happen if we have outliers, okay?